Welcome to the EFC webinar on the church and COVID. How are our pastors and leaders faring? My name is Karen Stiller, your webinar host for today, and we have a wonderful uh, expert panel joining us. Um, but we also want to encourage you to participate through the chat function and also sending questions if you have them through the Q&A function if you're joining us by Zoom or if you're watching on Facebook, you can use the comments. Um, and we would love to uh, tackle your questions and insights as well. So the stresses of COVID-19 continue to weigh in on Christian leaders, of course. We've talked a lot already through previous webinars and podcasts about sort of the mechanics of being church right now in a time of COVID, things like wearing masks and humming and not singing and opening and not opening and what that all looks like. But today we thought we'd go more into the heart and the soul of how our leaders and people in the church as well are doing at this moment uh, in the pandemic. So I would like to ask the panel first to introduce themselves and share a little bit of their expertise on this topic, and then we'll jump right in. So um, Margaret, welcome. Why don't you lead us off? Thank you. Wonderful to be here. So I'm Margaret Clark. I'm a professor and program coordinator at Briarcrest Seminary, and I head up the our two graduate counseling programs that we have here. Um, I am also um, in the midst of doing my PhD at the University of Saskatchewan, and I am studying um, clergy resilience there as, as my dissertation. And so I'm in the midst of finishing up my data collection and analyzing all of that right now. Um, I'm also a therapist, and in my practice, I specialize in working with clergy. And in addition to that, I am a clergy spouse. So my husband has been in pastoral ministry for over 25 years, recently transitioned into a parachurch uh, role. So that's a little bit about me and what I bring to this. Wonderful. Well, you bring a lot to this. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dan. Yeah, uh, my name is Dan Goddard. I'm a lead pastor at Victory Church in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And uh, it's a just a privilege to be a part of this. Thank you, Karen and uh, EFC. Um, I also uh, serve with the ministerial here in Moose Jaw and interact with the other pastors in our town, as well as uh, I serve in our denomination as a regional overseer of uh, eight churches. So I get to work with pastors of churches of 20 or 30 people and uh, some of two or three or 400 people. Wonderful. Thank you. And Tim. It's great to be with you, Karen, and uh, with the other panelists. Tim Day, I previously was in pastoral ministry, um, a senior pastor at a church called The Meeting House, and did that for 14 years. Um, prior to that, uh, planted a church and youth pastor, so had pretty much done pastoral ministry most of my life. And now I'm working with a team called Waybase, and a part of what we're doing with uh, that platform is uh, surveying, uh, providing kind of a, a feedback loop for the church. Uh, during COVID. And so we've done uh, two national surveys in tracking with the impact of COVID on um, Christian ministries across Canada. Very good. Wow. Okay. Welcome, everyone. So if you're viewing, you'll see the uh, panelists we have and the expertise they bring. And again, we welcome your mm -hmm. questions. But Margaret, my first question is for you to begin us off. Uh, this is a stressful time for church leaders uh, to make the biggest understatement of the year. Um, you're a therapist, but you also have this amazing wealth of information with your clergy wellness research. So can you share with us some of the pressures, the top pressures that you think church leaders might be experiencing right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so church leaders in general um, identify um, some three kind of broad categories that, that causes challenge for them. So one of those is workload. And it, there are a lot of di dimensions to that complexity, the time demands, um, relational components, all of that. Also, um, expectations is an aspect of, of challenge for um, pastors. And then also isolation. And so those are in general, um, some of the categories that are challenging for clergy. Uh -oh. and so, <laughs> yeah. And so then when you add COVID onto yeah. that, we can understand. So for instance, in workload, hearing from people who already feel like they have to navigate going from premarital counseling to church finances, to death and grieving 
and HR issues. And now we add social media experts and online streaming expertise. And so just that extra level of complexity um, certainly is challenging. Um, with that also the um, element of expectations and some of the relational dynamics, um, there have been some very challenging things that have come up say around the mask debate and to open and not to open um, and lots of different views on that. Um, and so that just adds another level of, of challenge there. And then one of the things that, that, that for many, many pastors, they really value the communal aspect of their work and their own faith expression. And so that has been challenged in so many ways during COVID. And so that loss of actually being with people and being able to minister to them and with them um, has just been really challenging for folks. Yeah. Dan, does that jive with um, what you've experienced personally, maybe, and your team, but what you're hearing from your peers and these other pastors you're in connection with? Yeah, for sure. All of all of those things uh, are challenging and have, have made it challenging for me personally and certainly for uh, other pastors and peers that I've been talking to. Um, we're learning new skills uh, all the time right now and skills that we never expected to be learning. Uh, a lot of pastors are saying, you know, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't uh, plan for this, you know, um, so uh, that's stressful. And then that isolation, you know, um, we do, we've done lots of online services where we have no, no one, virtually no one in person. And uh, there's, there's, there's definitely an emptiness uh, to it and a sense of isolation to it. And uh, it uh, sort of uh, makes those feelings of loneliness that we're all feeling during this time it makes those uh, come to the forefront. Yeah. yeah. Are you connecting down with this, uh, like the ministerial you mentioned, you're a part of the ministerial. Are you, are you, are you pastors connecting maybe more than you used to, or, or is everyone just too busy to reach out to each other? No, I think we do. I think that's a positive aspect of it. Uh, people tend to take more time to reach out to each other. Um, you know, even when you're not talking to pastors, you're just talking to folks, uh, they'll say, you know, I've, I've spoken to my extended family more than usual through nice. COVID or things like that. So uh, as pastors, uh, I know in our town, we, we uh, are, have been trying to meet on Zoom uh, on a weekly basis just to pray for each other. And we keep it short so that everybody still wants to come, you know, and, but also uh, just a quick text message to each other, um, a phone call. I had a friend yesterday, I was going through some hard challenges, uh, I appreciated Margaret said HR challenges on top of everything else. And I was having some HR challenges in, in our organization. And I just texted a, a pastoral friend in another city. And I said, hey, do you have a few minutes to talk? And uh, those are very valuable moments. We need that. You know, what I've noticed uh, in my own work, which, um, and, you know, just heard other people talking about that. I, I feel like I have a reduced capacity to do, um, to do work when more is required of me, you know, so I feel like everything has a greater energy cost almost during this time, uh, certainly at the beginning, and then more was required. I, and for pastors, I think that must be true. Is yeah, that I, I think so. And I think we, uh, when we're stressed, we, we tend to isolate ourselves, we tend mm -hmm. not to want to reach out, and we tend not to want to learn new skills and, you know, press forward, we, <laughs> right. we tend to re retreat, we get in defensive mode. So all the things we need to do right now are the very things we don't feel like doing and, and we're not in the mood to do. So that's that's extra challenging for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tim, a couple of times I've spoken with you during this and you've mentioned that you have heard from some pastors who want to quit actually or retire early, take, mm -hmm. uh, you know, re retirement 30 years earlier. <laughs> Can, tell me about that. Like it's, I mean, is that actually a thing that pastors are wanting to leave because they're so worn out? I, I definitely think there's a segment of pastors that wonder if they're cut out for this. Huh. That'd be the type of phrase, like, am I cut out to do this? And um, uh, definitely there have been, depending on how much safety there is, where they might share that. It might be an internal thought. It may be just something they share with a spouse or a partner or with um, you know, somebody they're very close with. But I think it relates to the way that we're emotionally wired and those natural feedback loops that you get when you're you speak on a Sunday and people come up interact with you can just feel just what God's doing in their lives and you realize yeah that thing that you prayed about and felt to share God used that in that moment or 
you know, there's a lot of things that just happen through the course of being in community. These soft touch points that give us that emotional feedback loop that I know how I'm doing. And when you get into a place where you just have to output and you really never know emotionally how you're doing, you just keep doing that. After a while, you feel like something's not right. And it's this creeping feeling like, I'm, a, I'm more than isolated. I, I am, I'm, a, I'm adrift. I'm floating out here. And I don't know how to reach land again. And I think it's like an emotional thing. It's hard to put words on. But it's, I think it's very hard for people who carry the weight of shepherding a community to, while in the midst of that, feel the, those inner feelings of being adrift. I definitely think the tiredness to Margaret that you mentioned, so many have said to me, and I've used this test with them. I, I, I said, how I feel is like I'm in my exams and every week I have a full day of exams and I'm just exhausted mentally at the end of that day. And tons of them said, that's exactly what it feels like. I'm just exhausted mentally at the end of every day. And I used to have car rides I used to have coffees with people. I used to have breaks. And now all I do is sit in front of my screen, meeting after meeting, after meeting, after meeting, and I'm exhausted. Why? D does that resonate with you, Dan, and your pastor buds? <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, we, we joke in normal times that, uh, you know, we quit every Monday, right? That just, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but certainly in these seasons, I mean, I've had, lots of conversations with with pastor friends who just said you know i think i'm done i think i think my season is is coming to a close and and then you know there i i would flip that around it's a little bit of a roller coaster there are rallying moments and rallying points um there's moments of encouragement and excitement and a, a sense that god is indeed moving and and i think pastors do know uh the, the truth we have to sort of preach it to ourselves right now um, <laughs> But we remind ourselves God is sovereign and, and he's still in control. And so then there are those moments where we, we, we climb back up on the hill and, and we can sort of see again. And, but, but certainly uh, we're hitting more valleys than usual right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. So, Margaret, give us some hope. What, um, <laughs> what is your guidance for pastors and church leaders who are feeling all mm -hmm. of that right now? Yeah. So the, the focus in my dissertation has really been around this, this aspect of what resources do different pastors and clergy identify as helping them to be resilient. So when they run into the challenges and the adversity, what helps them to be resilient? And it's been, it's been fascinating just to hear the diversity of what people identify. Certainly not surprising is, is, is the relationship with God and spiritual practices um, and just how meaningful those are. Um, also the relational um, resources and everything from spouse and family and friends and mentors to professional resources like counseling or spiritual direction um, and those type of things. And, and another piece that's been really interesting is how staying connected to calling has been so meaningful. And, and one of the most meaningful things in my interviews has been um, at the end of the interview, I, I asked about in hopes that the interview was also meaningful to the people I interviewed. And one of the things that they said was it was really meaningful to be reminded of their calling mm -hmm. and to be reminded of the ways in which, you know, God has been present and they have been through these ups and downs. And so that would be something I think to think about is I think this season things have gotten out of balance, right? In lots of ways, the challenges we face are kind of balanced with the, the, the resources we access. And what happened is on the, the challenge side, there was like a whole bunch of stuff stuffed up down there. And so it might be a season to think about maybe what are some of the resources that you've used in the past that are maybe not as present um, that you could increase a little bit. So again, like Dan said, reaching out more to some of those peer supports and friend supports. Um, you know, again, maybe you've been thinking about engaging with a spiritual director or a counselor just to give you some space um, to really process um, or increasing even like some of the health behaviors like walking and exercising more and engaging in some of those things. Um, it just helps kind of think about balancing out and recalibrating a little bit. So that would be an encouragement uh, I think I've seen in a lot of people. Yeah. Does binge watching on Netflix help? <laughs> that was not necessarily anything identified as okay. a resource, but uh, it maybe has its benefits in different ways. 
<laughs> I'd love for us to define resilience. Can you, Margaret, can you explain what resilience actually is and looks like in your work? Mm, yeah. So again, resilience is really in definition, is, is defined by adversity um, or challenges. You know, adversity doesn't always resonate with pastors, but it's really about this ability to positively adapt to adversity, right? So it, you know, sometimes we think about the term of bounce back. Um, again, for me, I look at that. So there's, there's sort of the perspective, oh, people are, have a personality that's resilient or they don't. And there's a interesting line of research around that. I, I look at it much more in a systemic perspective, which means that we, we look at that there are certainly are individual resources that we use and have that help us to be resilient, but there's also relational resources. And there are also things like organizational. Um, a lot of denominations in this time have increased their support. Um, of pastors, and that's actually something that clergy would say has been has been really meaningful um, in those ways. So I think looking at it as a sense of there are things that people do that they find helps them to respond and, and sort of weather the adversity and and be okay in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the also the pressure of just, you know, the financial um, hit that some churches have taken that ultimately, I'm sure a pastor would feel responsible for. Tim, you've done some research on that, on uh, how churches are actually sort of surviving in on that level. Um, and you've been a pastor, as you mentioned. So tell us about that angle, like having to carry all that too. it has got to be a worry element. It, it definitely is created, and I think, Dan, you're mentioning, um, made some mention of this too, with the HR issues that are coming along. There's, with the drop of income, about 60% would report that they are um, below what they would normally expect as a, an income uh, for this time of year, 60 to 70%, and some are dramatically lower. Now, they ad adjusted very quickly. One of the things about ministry leaders is they are um, a, a tune, naturally attuned type people, and they make quick adjustments and they're used to navigating uh, uh, types of changing environments because they're used to working with lots of people. And so they quickly adapted and had to make the necessary hard cuts, whether that was maybe laying off a part-time staff or, or adjusting their budgets and their expenses to climatize to whatever their income is. There is a certain percentage that got hit very hard um, and had significant drops in income. And they're, they're probably different than other churches that dropped a little bit, maybe 10 or 20%, and they made their adjustments. But in the midst of all of that, there's cascading effects financially. And I'll give you a couple. One is <laughs> managing with a board. Will we bounce back this Christmas? Um, will we be able to get that offering in by year end like we normally get? Are, are there economic impacts in my church? People who maybe have lost jobs went into lockdown again. And now I'm supporting people who maybe are worried about their jobs and that might impact their ability to support us the normal way. Um, maybe we have to have new jobs, uh, you know, new people doing new things because somebody who is working part-time for me or full-time is not working now because we had to lay them off. There's so many cascading things that they do adapt, but it kind of is like that club sandwich that just keeps stacking up and any one layer would have been fine, but you just keep adding all the issues up and it kind of goes back to that point of resilience. It just, it's exhausting. It becomes mentally exhausting or if I could say this other one, it sets you on edge to what's what bad thing is going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And I've heard somebody say this about, uh, use this phrase, doom scrolling, where um, people have this new tendency to get up in the morning and check the news to find out what bad thing is happening. And they don't even realize they're doing it, but they're scanning for danger because they know that they're the leader who's in the midst of this that has to make sense of it for people, adjust. And, and be ready to sort it out either for themselves, for their team or for their church. So I do think that kind of compounds the financial economic impacts are many. And that does tie into how a pastor feels, but maybe Dan, you can corroborate what I'm saying or not. Well, yeah, I, I think exactly everything you've said is, is so true. In the peers that I've been speaking with, um, there hasn't been a, a huge drop in giving. There's been a small drop in giving. That's kind of mm -hmm. what I'm hearing amongst my own friends, so anecdotally. 
Uh, I'm concerned uh, that those who have had a huge drop aren't saying so uh, to me. You know, they, they're experiencing it quietly somewhere and, and sort of keeping it quiet. So that, that concerns me. But uh, on a more personal level, like our church's giving has dropped about 8% uh, year over year. And uh, our expenses have dropped more than that. And we were already running a, a profitable budget. So we're not concerned about our finances in that sense. But just like you explained, there's lots of uh, anxiety around that, lots of board discussions around that. Uh, you know, we triage where we would lay people off at what points. And those are, those are not fun meetings to sit through mm -hmm. and, and work through. And, uh, and then even as a church, I've had to lead our church towards increased online giving um, and faithfulness through a hard time. And really, I'd, I'd rather not be focused on finances right now. I'd rather be focused on people's souls and their anxieties and concerns. So I, I live inside that tension of, you know, I've got to lead our church financially well, but I really want to shepherd our people well right now. So it's, it, that, that's a challenging thing. Yeah. Do you want to weigh in on that, Margaret? You know, it's interesting. Again, in the best of times, finances are a challenge. For, and one of the, ex, like the pressures and expectations that clergy identified. Um, and again, it's an interesting mix at, you know, Dan identified some really interesting points about just the organizational pressure it puts on on a, a pastor, but there's also this piece of, of personal finances are tied to church finances. And that's a whole nother dimension. Um, and, and whether it's, you know, your own livelihood, that's concern or staff that you're concerned about, that that is a, a very challenging and hard, hard part of the role that they're facing. Yeah. Dan, when you were talking about churches uh, that, that you haven't heard from people who whose giving has gone down a lot, I thought it'd be hard to be the one person in the meeting saying our churches experience this big hit and everyone else is like, oh, we're getting more than we ever have, <laughs> which speaks to me about the, actually, but of course, when one person is brave enough to do that, it's very powerful and it opens up the discussion and this whole question of, I guess, finding someone you can be vulnerable with. Margaret, that must be so important when we think about friendships for clergy right now, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that you talk. One of the challenges when one of the factors under isolation was actually identified by the participants I talked to as, as pure competition, that mm -hmm. they actually see that as an isolating factor among each other is that there sometimes isn't this sort of camaraderie, but instead there's competition. And yet peers were so important. And, you know, again, one of the key relational supports, peers were important in the sense of a, a having a safe but having people who got it. Um, so friends were important, things like that. But the, the, the aspect of peers was just so important because instead of having to kind of explain the unique nature, like a pastoral role is so unique in the diversity of what it involves. And so it was, it was something that was really meaningful. Um, and a lot of people had sort of ongoing um, relationships with peers. And so if that's something that somebody hasn't had coming into this, um, it might be quite a lonely without that because they won't have that. It's encouraging, again, I think, as hearing things like what Dan talked about, where there's this increased um, engagement, you know, Zoom, Zoom meetings or calls. Um, again, some of the denominations have stepped up and people have, have really appreciated the chance to just be together with peers and talk. Yeah. Can, and just can I jump? Yeah, go sorry. for it, Tim. Yeah, I was just going to say a thought for if there's any pastors listening and you feel a bit isolated. Um, one of the things that I have found, uh, you know, it's like a different way to approach the gap is to pray and say, who is it that needs you to reach out to them? And, and to pray and see about who you might just do like a text message to and do it authentically, pray and see who the Lord lays on your heart <laughs> and then say, how are you doing? And is there anything I can pray about or just want to check in? Uh, the times that I felt prompted and I responded to that, it's been amazing to me how they've reached back and have actually wanted to get a safe place to have a conversation. And then I realized in that, that I ended up processing how I'm doing too as well. And so um, sometimes it can be quite, how do I say, like kind of organic and unplanned, <laughs> but it can still be very meaningful and real. But it, it I just a thought I wanted to share with, with, um, cause I know as a pastor, it's sometimes hard to, to know where do I take how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. 
Dan, what were you going to say? Yeah, well, uh, just uh, Tim, thank you. That is very powerful. And I think reaching out uh, to each other one on one is, is huge. And it not only uh, will give some people the freedom to share some of their struggles they wouldn't have shared otherwise, but it, it turns out to bless us, right? When we right. reach out to somebody else. Um, I, I think as pastors, one of the le- things we can learn how to do better, especially in groups, is to share our struggles. Uh, mm-hmm. I know in my own organization, we, we love sharing testimonies and we love <laughs> telling each other how good God is and, and what good things are happening. And so whenever we get together, that's sort of, the first thing on the agenda, who has a great, you know, celebration. Um, but it, that easily turns into a, a sense of competitiveness amongst pastors. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we connect with each other in our struggles. That's where we connect. Um, that's where deeper connection happens. So I just think as groups to learn as pastors, you know, open up the floor for people to share some of their challenges. What are your prayer requests? Those kind of discussions are, are very helpful in life giving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is so helpful. Um, I was thinking about, uh, I, and I don't want us to focus the whole time on the bad stuff, <laughs> but um, it is about a bad stuff conversation, I guess. But just a reminder to people who are watching that you can certainly um, write, if you're on Facebook, you can write in the comment any question and it will get passed to us uh, on Zoom. Use the Q&A if you want. We'd love to hear how you're doing these days. Um, but just the the criticism sometimes also that, <clears throat> pardon me, pastors have to deal with. Like I caught a little conversation online a while ago where um, the critique was like, oh, now everyone wants to be a Facebook preaching star. And, you know, this sort of like implied criticism of of pastors who actually had to go online and, and, you know, made that shift for the sake of their congregation, I think. So I just, I don't know. I know that just goes with the territory. Sometimes you can kind of, you know, you're, you get criticism no matter what, but can we talk about that a little bit and how that plays into resiliency? Margaret, how do you develop that thick skin to just not Mm -hmm. let that stuff bother you? Yeah, definitely that that piece of like expectations, congregational expectations, all of those type of things are, again, it's a significant thing. And then the relational dynamic that goes with it, often clergy's the the conflict is sort of directed at them. Mm-hmm. And so very challenging. Um, certainly an aspect would be that 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 some folks would identify might be called balance in that sense of how much of life is is all invested in ministry and where are there other parts of life. Um, Again, this might be personal parts of life, like relational parts and hobbies and those kind of things. And then the other piece would be the kind of concept of boundaries of of when is it, um, you know, when when is just needing to say no to certain things and um, boundaries also around emotional well-being um, and and having a healthy kind of place of knowing that um, and identity. And so this is again, where it comes back, circles back a lot for a lot of people in their sense of identity in who they are in God and that there's an okayness that they are not the perfect anything, um, that they are called to this and it's okay not to be perfect. Um, because there's a lot of pressure. One of the concepts for me, when I think about, you know, you know, for congregations, if you want to help your pastor, think about the, the ways you put expectations on them. <laughs> um, Uh, You know, and you might think, oh, it's one little very reasonable expectation, but they may have hundreds or thousands in some congregations. If you kind of think about them, they're they're the kind of the the middle of the wheel on if, you know, they have all these spokes coming at them. And so it may be that times who knows how many. And um, often I don't think I don't think we realize in our own sort of individualism and consumerism in the church that we actually put tremendous pressure on the pastors and so just to be aware of that and sensitive to that, I think is important. And then for clergy, unfortunately, they, they I don't know if thick skin would be the word, but they, they, they have to spend a lot of time caring for their own well-being um, because it, it's, it's rough. Like they, they do get a lot coming at them. Yeah. How, does that uh, resonate with you, Dan? Have you, I, I'm sure no one has criticized you since this pandemic began, right. but how do you cope with that kind of critique that might come in sometimes? Yeah, I think as leaders, we do feel the pull. Uh, we, we know the opinions and ideas uh, typically of our congregation members. And even when we don't know them, sometimes we assume them. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, 
feel the pull uh, of, of various directions. And right now, culture is very polarized. So we know that in our congregations, that those polarizations exist. And um, so, so we, I don't know if we face uh, that much direct criticism as maybe some criticism that we even just believe is there in our own mm -hmm. minds. Um, and sometimes even reading people's posts, you know, and, and uh, allowing that to sort of eat away at our souls. But a, a lot of pastors do struggle with people pleasing um, and trying to keep everybody happy. And I, I, I appreciated Margaret's uh, early statement about uh, coming back to our calling and being clear on our calling and um, being clear that we have an audience of one. I think most pastors have to do that on a regular basis. And in, in COVID, that would be a, a real key. Mm -hmm. Tim, do you want to weigh in on that? I've heard a, a fair number. Now, it depends on where you are. Um, one of the complex issues that got added in was the protests in the U.S. related to mm -hmm. racism. Mm -hmm. And so we had one, which was masks. Do we come back? Do we not come back? Do to, you know, what do we do with all of those things that you mentioned earlier, Karen, um, in some of those things where people can be divided, but they also, a number of pastors that I've talked to really had to step up quickly. Like they had to all turn on a dime. Do they put a black image on their social image on that one day or not? Was that virtue signaling um, people who are upset about not enough uh, racial representation in their staff or on their boards? And they had to quickly pivot or dance or figure out what to do. And so I do think when you say we're in a polarizing time, we're in a time where a lot of people are stressed emotionally. And the way they take that out is by, you know, becoming upset, feeling there's urgency and they express that. And pastors can very much be looked to as the person who can solve everything. If they would just preach that one sermon and say it all right and make everybody get in line, then everybody would be better and you know, that's just not how it works. <laughs> and um, so I do think that there is, it's these compounding issues that come in. And um, I think we're, we're now in a time in leadership where one other thing I'll add into this, maybe I'll say for the pastors who are listening, you know, um, Almost nobody that I've talked to in other industries who are in significant leadership feel like they're being successful right now. So if you're a pastor, you're probably being more successful than you realize. And if you have that Monday morning, like, I don't feel like I'm as great as I used to be or whatever, or I don't know that I can manage all this. I want to assure you that these are very complex times. And these are times where things ch um, change overnight. Like, you know, your operational plan is three days long and you've changed it tomorrow. And uh, just want to encourage you, you're probably doing better than you realize. And if you do feel weighed down, um, yeah, to find the people who are positive in your life, who can speak the truth and love to you to really lift you up, because these are incredibly complex times. Oh, that's, uh, I would think that would be wonderfully encouraging to hear. It's a good reminder, for sure. Um, Dan, how are people in your church doing these days? Have you sensed, a, a, you know, are they being resilient? Have you sensed any kind of shift since we last spoke, which would have been at the very beginning of this pandemic? Well, I think they're, the second wave is has hit people pretty hard, right? There's a sense of, uh, again, not knowing the future and again, not being sure how long we're going to be at this. So that's challenging for folks. And, um, and you know, uh, pastors and people, we're all going through this personally. So that's, uh, you know, everybody, and everybody's dealing with it a little bit differently and has, you know, like we're on this roller coaster, while we're, we're some of us are high in one moment and others down. So it's just like when you talk to uh, a couple who's going through grief together, one of the hard things about going through grief with other people is that you, you're at different stages at different times. And so yeah. you look at each other and you're like, how can you possibly think that way or feel that way? And mm -hmm. I think that's hard for people that increases the isolation uh, because at one moment you're, you know, on track and, and, and feel like you've, you're thinking straight and you see somebody else down and you're like trying to fix them. And then at the next moment you're down and they look like they're all on track and you think everything's wrong with you. So so yeah. yeah, it's it's been challenging for people. I think, mm -hmm. uh, I, and I, and I, I, Kim, I think your words 
fit for our, our parishioners as well as our pastors to mm -hmm. let them know, hey, hey, this is hard for everybody and uh, be encouraged, you know. Yeah, that's really good. So Dan, I think you'll have something to say uh, for this question that's come in um, because it's really directed to a congregation setting. Um, the, the hardest thing I'm finding to deal with is conflict in the congregation about mm -hmm. following the guidelines. And I bet we've all had this where uh, we get together with a friend for what we think is going to be a socially distanced walk and they want to hold your hand or something like <laughs> people following the rules differently. Uh, so some, some people complain about the impact of restrictions on church life and government overreach. Others, especially those with serious health concerns, feel like, you know, what's, what's the problem with those people? So um, have you had that, Dan? And how best to deal with that when you've got different people in your church following rules differently? Wow, that is challenging. <laughs> yes, we definitely have that in our congregation. I, the way I personally try to lead this, and I'm not sure uh, every congregation has the same calling, but uh, I think there's something beautiful in the kingdom of God, uh, in the diversity that we have, that we unify around Jesus and the gospel. Uh, mm. And then we have lots of diversity politically and um, even even on uh, theological secondary issues and so on. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I try to lead our church that way. I try to encourage people to have differences of opinions and be able to worship side by side. And, and I feel it. Uh, I, I feel that question. Boy, I have, I have people in my church who attend the anti-mask rallies. And then I have people in my church who are leading petitions for more masking. Okay. And they sit side by side and, and worship, you know, so. Well, not side by yeah. side. <laughs> <laughs> Close by, six, six feet apart. Yes, yes. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. So it, are, will those kinds of, uh, I wonder if the, if that sort of difference of opinion will create a bit of woundedness in our churches that we'll need to deal with after this is over. Like, will there be hard feelings? Yeah. I mean, I hope that it, it really expresses what the body of Christ is supposed to be. Uh, mm -hmm. I think when you read through scripture, you find this uh, Paul talking to the Romans saying, it's okay to have differences. Each of you should be fully convinced in your own minds, you know, um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but you're, you're followers of Jesus and that's our primary uh, unity. So. Yeah. Yeah. Margaret, any uh, sort of insights for pastors dealing with conflict in their con congregation on top of everything else? Well, I was thinking a bit more about, you know, as Dan was talking, I was thinking about um, just the impact on the pastors. And again, I think that piece of, there's this, sort of beauty and like we are all going through the same weirdness right globally like when that very rarely happens that we're all experiencing this and so I think there's a beautiful kind of unity in that where we can all kind of empathize with one another at the same time I think it can diminish at times like we sort of feel like we can't have a bad day because mm -hmm. like who who am I like everybody's going through this and so I think for pastors in particular, so helpers, and I, I include myself in this as a therapist, um, like pastors have often a really hard time getting help themselves. Mm -hmm. And because we're so often in the helping role to, to be in that either mutual caregiving role or, you know, be the, the person receiving help is really challenging. Mm -hmm. And so I think because of that, then we can deny how we're feeling at times, right? In the midst of this, we are all going to have some bad times. Even if we have some really good times, there's going to be bad days. And so finding in the midst of that, say in the midst of this conflict, you may be really angry, right? You may be angry at your congregants for what they're doing or saying. They may have views that are quite opposed to you. And so I think having those ways to process that again in, in, in safe spaces and, um, and not to just deny it, because again, the toll I think is just so much, there's just sort of so much anxiety and stress. If that's the case, it's, it's going to be too much. So um, I know this sounds like, of course, you're going to say that because you're a therapist, but talking helps. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. it, the reality is it does, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a therapist, but maybe it does. And naming how we're feeling helps. Just actually saying, I feel angry or I feel frustrated actually helps diminish the feeling and helps us feel more in, 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 in relationship to that. It changes it. So that's just where I would encourage people to, to just be tuned into that and not feel like just like, oh, okay, well, everybody's going through this. Therefore, who am I to feel this way? It's, it's, you feel that way. It's, it's good to have support. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you. All right, as we uh, draw to a close, I'm going to ask uh, another question that just came in, but it's what I want it to do is kick off um, our encouragement phase of the webinar, where we uh, leave people with some good thoughts. And it does feel, I, you know, th there is a vaccine on the horizon, hopefully, that it feels like maybe, maybe we are halfway through this thing, maybe the end is in sight. And, and I know I've learned lots. I hope I have. Um, I think I've learned about my own resilience and also a lot about my need for other people, in fact. Um, so that's been a, a lesson for me that I'm going to carry forward. So I'll read you this question and then I'm going to ask you to, to answer it however you'd like, but uh, just end with some encouragement and um, what your advice would be for pastors and church leaders as they move into this next phase. Um, so this viewer says, what about viewing the pandemic as the beginning of birth pangs, meaning the Lord's return is coming nearer? It, would that be a source of encouragement to us as it was to the church, church in Thessalonica? So that's, I like, I like where that question is taking us in terms of it's a big silver lining posture. Um, Dan, do you want to start us off on that? Sure. I, I mean, I, I like that question too. It it leads us to see that we're in in God's big picture and in God's mm -hmm. plan. And uh, I think we have to keep bringing ourselves there. God does have a plan. This didn't take him by surprise. He does know when it will end and it's okay that we don't. So um, maybe one of my big encouragements to leaders and pastors would be uh, to lead yourself well through this time. Uh, lead yourself to the Lord. Lead yourself to uh, various waters of encouragement that will uh, strengthen you. If we're going to lead others well, we have to lead ourselves well. And uh, that's going to be increasingly difficult. So we're going to have to put more energy probably into that than we used to. And, uh, mm. and so that means thinking about your own discipleship journey. Uh, what is God teaching me lately? What is God using this uh, to do in my life and in my own walk with the Lord? Kind of living more in the Psalms maybe where, you know, people are processing their own difficulties, like Margaret uh, said so well, we got to process our own challenges. Um, and I, I think uh, just one other encouragement would be to try to stay humble through this uh, and maybe hold your opinions uh, with an open hand. I, I think right now it just seems so easy to have a short fuse and to have quick opinions and strong opinions very quickly and to just say, well, you know, we're going to know more. <laughs> In a year, in 10 years, in a thousand years, in a couple million years, we'll know even more. So uh, to just be careful uh, to, to keep a humble heart and, uh, and say, well, I'm here to serve and I don't know everything and I'm okay with not knowing everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Margaret, how about you next? Mm -hmm. I think that the question made me think about um, what a resource our theological hope is mm. and our theological perspectives on suffering. And I think that's a unique thing that, you know, we have as Christians and, and followers of Jesus is that we don't just view things sort of one dimensionally is that we have a big picture view as Dan was saying. And so I think in this, um, you know, again, reminding of ourselves of our theological hope and, and in whatever ways people find that, right? There may be a really meaningful scripture or a, a, a writing that reminds you of that. The, the book Surprised by Hope comes to mind for me. Um, and so in whatever those might be for you to, to, to find those and maybe um, engage with those again. Um, and yeah, I think the piece, you know, I was thinking about the question about those who may be really at the end of their rope and thinking about either retiring or quitting retirement again, maybe, you know, that may be a, a fairly minor change. It's just a matter of timing that, you know, maybe thinking about that and, you know, it's, but for those who were maybe thinking about a very major life decision, it's, it's challenging to make a major life decision in the midst of crisis. Mm -hmm. And so again, if you can engage with some people who, who, you know, are, are supportive and who are wise in your life, just not to, to go through that alone. Um, and again, for all of us, we need to just think about the ways we can increase some of our resources. And again, it could be tiny little changes. Again, just something that where you're kind of like, yeah, this would probably be healthy for me. This would probably make me feel good. And then for others, it might be a little bit bigger things, um, but not to just kind of, um, yeah, yeah. Just to, just to think about that as maybe think about what, what could be helpful for you. Thank you, Margaret. Tim, your last wise words. Hmm. Well, I don't know if they're wise, but my final uh, final thoughts. I think the question for me sparks um, uh, the recognition that over history, the church has weathered many, many 
uh, major things, major crises, pandemics, wars, all sorts of turbulence. And one of the phrases that I found really helpful is, um, this may be the end of the world as we knew it. It may not be the end of the world, but it may be the end of the world as we know it and the beginning of something new. The beginning of, there may be some new things that we wake up to globally on the other side of this. Now, the great thing is we're, we serve the God of resurrection, of creation and recreation. We, we serve the God who um, tells us, see, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? And the beauty of that verse in Isaiah says, I'm making streams in the wilderness, right? that God has a life source for us in our worst circumstances. And, and I, I try to remind people that God works best and is best seen in our worst circumstances, because when everything's good, God may offer us something good, but that's just one of 20 things. When we're in a barren wasteland and everything looks hopeless, when God brings that good life stream to us of hope, we know it's God without doubt. And we see God more clearly than ever. So I believe that this could be the end of the world as we knew it. We won't be going back to 2018 or 2019. We're going to go ahead to 2021. It's probably going to be different than we ever imagined. And on the other side, it'll be different. And our jobs may change a bit and our, everything may keep changing for a while. But we, we serve the God of resurrection, of recreation, and uh, whether this is the final, we don't know, <laughs> but we know that that process, is, he's been faithful, right? For thousands of years, God has been faithful. God is unchanging. He will be faithful to you, to us. And um, our, I think the question for me that I'm left with is not so much what God will do, because God will be consistent. The question for me is going to be whether I surrender myself in those moments of vulnerability to God. And there's a lot of things that were shared here as really wise advice from Margaret and Dan that I'm just listening to. And if I was a pastor listening, do you know my hard thing coming out of this would be? is to trust God enough to step out and do some of this stuff, which is leaning into my vulnerability right now to allow God to work in that space, to allow this to be a time of my own change, not to fortify or dig in or deny, but to reach out, become a bit more vulnerable. So I, I just share that with as a final thought as somebody just processing it in my own life that um, I am learning how to trust God in deeper ways through this time. And that means trusting people around me and uh, trusting that God has good plans ahead for me. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Tim. And th thank you, Dan. That was, uh, I, I feel better. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope that anybody watching this will uh, feel encouraged and uh, that they're not alone and that uh, there is great hope. So I, you've all just done a wonderful job and thank you. Mm -hmm.